Hello everybody, welcome back to the Epic Flight Academy, private pilot ground school course. Our topic today is aeronautical decision making, or pilots frequently say ADM for short. ADM, or aeronautical decision making, is asking ourselves a simple question. Is every decision I'm making leading to a safe outcome for this flight? Sometimes people think that decision makers are born, not made. Well, research shows that, in fact, we can learn to make good decisions. When we talk about aeronautical decision making, this is a process that we learn that enhances the probability of decreasing human error in the cockpit. Now, what we're dealing with here is risk management. Risk is all about managing hazards. A hazard is a real or a perceived condition. For example, in the practice area, we might have this cumulonimbus thunderstorm cloud. That is a potential hazard. Or, it's possible, our aircraft could have been fueled with the wrong fuel. That's a potential hazard. It's just an existing condition. Thus far, it has not caused us a problem. Risk management is managing, eliminating, or mitigating in some way those hazards. For example, if we elect not to go flying with that thunderstorm cloud out there, we have eliminated that risk. Or, if we're doing a very careful pre-flight and we notice that we've got the wrong fuel in this aircraft, we don't fly the airplane, we defuel it, we take care of that issue, we've managed that risk. So risk management is mitigating, eliminating, or managing hazards. Now, some of these hazards exist mentally in our mind, in our head. It has to do with our judgments and our attitudes. In aviation over the years, we have identified five specific hazardous attitudes. Let's walk through those in order. The first one is anti-authority. The anti-authority hazardous attitude sounds like this. Don't tell me. Don't tell me what to do. I don't need to comply with the FARs. I know better than the FAA. The anecdote for this hazardous attitude, follow the rules. Those rules are there for a reason. They work, slow down, follow the rules. Hazardous attitude number two. This is called impulsivity or being impulsive. It's my desire to do it quickly. For example, we might say, come on, let's get this flight in the air. We don't need to do a thorough pre-flight. That may cause us to have missed the improper fuel in that aircraft. My impulsive attitude is, is detracting from my ability to manage that risk. The anecdote for impulsivity is slow down, not so fast. Let's think about this first. All right, the third one, the third hazardous attitude invulnerability. It couldn't happen to me. Sounds something like this. We've flown that 172 so many times. We've flown at the practice area. Nothing's ever gone wrong. What could possibly happen on this flight? That's an attitude of invulnerability. When you start thinking that it wouldn't happen to you or couldn't happen to you, that's when you might get caught. The anecdote for that attitude is, it could happen to me. You have to stop yourself and say, it hasn't happened this time, but that's because we've been working and doing this professionally. You have to do this every single time. We are not invulnerable. It could happen. The fourth one is called macho. Now, this happens when we feel like um, we could do anything. We're just I can handle it. I don't need help. Don't need assistance. I can do it. I've got the airplane. We, I can handle this. Um, I can do it. Watch this. If you've ever said to a friend or a group of friends, hey, watch this while I try this, uh, that's an indication of the macho attitude. 
The anecdote for the macho attitude is, well, yes, in fact, it could happen to me. All right, and the, the fifth and final uh, hazardous attitude is called resignation. Resignation sounds like this, oh, what's the use? There's nothing I can do about it. I have to get the airplane home, even though the weather's deteriorating. I don't control the weather. What am I going to do? There's nothing I can do. I'll just have to keep proceeding into those IMC conditions, even though I'm not instrument rated. That can lead to a serious accident. That's a hazardous attitude. The anecdote for that is, I'm not helpless. Look, there are always alternatives. There is something I can do. I can turn around. I don't have to get to that airport today. So these are our five hazardous attitudes. So we need to think carefully about them, work with our flight instructor, and be conscious of those anecdotes. Now, another aspect of aeronautical decision making is when we're operating as single pilots. In other words, we're flying solo. This is known as SRM. That's short for Single Pilot Resource Management. SRM, the art and science of managing all the resources available to me as a pilot. When we talk about SRM, there's several checklists that we can use to help ourselves manage these resources. The first set of checklists is a before flight group of checklists. You can see those here. The I'm safe checklist, pave and care. We use these checklists before flight. Now, the I'm safe checklist talks about yourself as the pilot. I stands for illness, how do I feel, M for medication, am I taking any, stress, what kind of stress am I under right now, alcohol, have I had any, and fatigue, how am I feeling, and the E is for emotion and eating. Now, when we look in the AIM in chapter 8, the I'm safe checklist E is for emotion keeping myself in a calm, professional attitude, right? Making sure I'm conscious of any of those five hazardous attitudes, managing myself emotionally. But we also like to say eat. It's important that we eat properly. If we come into the FBO and we take that classic uh, uh, can of soda and a candy bar, our blood sugar shoots up, 30 minutes later, we're in the airplane, our blood sugar drops off, and that could lead to uh, a potential uh, hazard uh, or risk. So eating is, is critical. The PAVE checklist. There's four parts to the PAVE checklist, and it is a great checklist because it's all-inclusive. It's so encompassing. The P stands for you, the pilot, the pilot in command. And so here I might use the I'm safe checklist or anything else that has to do with me uh, as the pilot. A stands for the aircraft. The A for aircraft is anything that has to do with this airplane. Is it safe? Is the paperwork up to date? Have I properly pre-flighted, etc. The V is the V in the word environment. What's my environment for this flight? Where are we going? What are we doing? When we say environment, of course, we typically think of the weather. Well, certainly that is part of the environment. Other parts of the environment include airspace, terrain. In Florida, where we fly, we often say, well, we don't really have much terrain because we don't have mountains. It's true, we don't have mountains, but we do have the beautiful Florida Everglades. If I'm flying single engine over the Everglades, that's terrain. We might take a flight out, of the, out to the Bahamas, open water, that's terrain. That's all part of the environment, so this comes into consideration. The final E in the PAVE checklist is external pressures. What kind of external pressures are working on me? Get there-itis, get home-itis. These are some of those external pressures, as we mentioned earlier, might cause me to be tempted to fly 
VFR into instrument conditions if I have that resignation hazardous attitude? That's the PAVE checklist. CARE is another four-part checklist. C in CARE is consequences. What are the consequences of these actions? And A is alternatives. Again, I do have choices. What are some alternatives that I, that I could pursue? R is reality. This is kind of a balance against that macho hazardous attitude. Let's be realistic. What can I really do? What's the reality of this situation? And E is external factors. What external factors are stressing me right now that are pushing me, that are causing me maybe to um, accept some risk that I really shouldn't or have a hazardous attitude? All right, the second group of checklists we use when we talk about single pilot resource management are the during flight checklists. Here there's four particular checklists that we'd like to introduce to you. The first one is the five P's checklist. Plan, what's my plan for this flight? The plane, what about the plane itself? Again, we're talking about pre-flight and airworthiness. Then the third P, pilot. Once again, we're looking at ourselves. How am I doing? How am I feeling? Maybe I'll run the I'm safe checklist again. The next P, passengers. If I have passengers in the airplane, are they comfortable? Do they know what to do? They can even help me in the flight with a little bit of coaching. I can teach them the clock position. They can help me sight aircraft. Okay, are they comfortable? Um, do they know where the air vents are? Do they know when they can talk to me and when to be quiet? Managing the passengers. And the last one is P for program particularly in technically advanced aircraft. Do I know how to program all of the equipment that I'm working with? The second SRM checklist that we talk about using during flight is the three P's. Now, I like to think about using the three P's all the time. During flight, after flight, before flight, because the three P's checklist lends to me some situational awareness. And here's what I mean. The first P is to perceive. Am I perceiving everything around me? Now, the second P is process. What that means is, just because I've perceived everything, am I processing it and am I processing it accurately and correctly? Now, if those first two P's are true, then the third P is perform. Now I can take a, the uh, appropriate action. Okay, during flight checklist, number four, team. This is a great one. These, these, uh, the TEAM helps me manage risk. One option I have is to transfer the risk. Another option I have is to eliminate the risk. Remember when we canceled the takeoff for that cumulonimbus cloud? The A is accept. Well, sometimes I'm just resigned to the fact that there is a certain amount of risk involved and I'm going to accept it. But what I've done here is I've thought about it carefully and I've managed that risk and I know how much I'm going to accept. And then finally, mitigate. Mitigate or reduce. Let's say we decide to take off with that cumulonimbus cloud 20 miles west of the airport. Well, if it's moving south and I'm flying north, I can maintain my distance and mitigate that risk. The fourth and final checklist we use during flight is called the decide model. The beauty of the decide model is it says exactly what it's doing. It's helping me make a decision. I use it when I detect something out of the ordinary. Like what? All right, let's take a look. The first D in the decide model is detect. Maybe I see a um, high oil temperature, for example. Okay, then I move to E. E is estimate. Now, on a scale of 1 to 10, how critical is that high oil temperature? 10 being Captain Sullenberg landing in the Hudson River, and one being, eh, you know, I'm going to pay attention to it, but it's not real critical. 
The C in the decide model is choose or choices. Okay, what choices do I have with that high oil temperature? Oh, I could land immediately. Um, probably not necessary. I could run a checklist. Let's see if it's the gauge or if it's actually the temperature. Um, I could rich in the mixture, open cowl flax, flaps if I have those. So I've got several choices. The I then means out of those choices, identify which one, or sometimes more than one, of these choices I'm going to do. Now, the second D stands for the word do. This might sound a little funny. Sometimes I have to remind myself to actually do it. Some of you may have been in pressure cooker situations and some of you may not have experienced this yet. Sometimes what happens in those situations is humans will freeze up. When the pressure is high, sometimes the reaction is just to freeze. The do in the decide model is the little head slap to remind me, take the action. Don't be resigned. You're not helpless. You've identified what you're going to do. Do it. And then finally, the E in the decide model is evaluate. Now what this means is, evaluate all of the actions I've taken up to this point. Let's go back to detect. Besides that oil temperature, is there anything else to detect? Is it going up? Is it going down? Is the oil pressure changing? Are there other indicators? Um, is my estimation correct? Um, do I have other choices I haven't thought of? Should I identify a different course of action? Should I do something differently? So the E is just to go back and continually reevaluate that uh, decision-making process.